Welcome to Game Changers by Logitech G, the six-part podcast for the ones taking the risks, breaking the mold and changing the game. I'll be talking to a variety of people in the gaming world about different topics, from diversity in gaming to its effect on mental health. I'm your host, Alan Boyston. Esports is the fastest growing component of the UK video games industry. Revenue is expected to rise 20% over the next three years. Street Fighter V is even an Intel partner event at the Olympics. This is not just a few geeky kids playing in their bedroom. This is a generation that is redefining what is considered sport and what is entertainment. Today I'm joined by Henning Christensen, Logitech G Esports Partner Manager and Esports Marketing Manager at the British Esports Association, Morgan Ashurst. Welcome to the show, both of you today. So esports has grown obviously enormously over the past few years, but I want to find out a bit more about yourselves first. Henning, a bit about yourself, esports partnership manager at Logitech G. Uh, tell us a bit about what that involves, you know, day to day, your role and how you got into it. So yeah, what it means is I take care of the day to day operations with our different esports partners. Some of them are direct and some are indirect with the local markets. So I handle, um, we have strong partnerships such as uh, Navi, we have uh, G2, the Astralis Group, which has two IPs, um, and also works with the LEC, which is the European League of Legends League. And then we got uh, some minor teams as well throughout uh, Europe and AP, which we, we partner with as well. So making sure that uh, we work with them and, and see how we can help them, support them to achieve their goals, obviously with the tournaments, being successful in that. And also, you know, there is a component of, of other things which, which ties into our brand and what we wish to communicate and our role within the esport ecosystem. Now, seeing this involvement from Logitech G, many big companies have got involved in esports in the last five years in particular. I mean, esports has always been around, you know, competitive gaming into esports, but the last five years we've seen enormous growth, corporate investment on a different level. Uh, I just, you know, we're, we're sort of wondering where that sort of turning point was, where, where in the last five years has big business suddenly said, we want to be in esports? Um, I've been in the business quite a long time. I think esports had a huge setback during the financial crisis. A lot of the, the big brands were starting to invest and they had to de-invest for obvious reasons. And then there was not really uh, that many strong esports titles back then. There was Counter-Strike 1.6, which was a shooting game. <laughs> and then there was nothing else, more or less. And then came StarCraft, which was not, it was okay. And the behavior of watching as Twitch started to evolve. And before everyone had to use their games to watch so i would say that with the involvement of twitch which um, i would say is the, the single most important part that there was actually a behavior which was uh, comparable to uh, how do you say consuming regular sports and with that came league of legends which is the biggest esport in the world and, and the behavior of watching that and also a new version of counter-strike i think was the the big reasons of why it continued to grow, but in, in 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 numbers, it's for sure Twitch. Like that, you could broadcast and professional broadcast on Twitch, and that all gamers united on Twitch. Now they're kind of you know a bit of everywhere, but I think these two titles together with Twitch was probably the turning point. Absolutely, well, it's continued to grow. We're going to talk about that. Morgan, tell us a bit about your background in esports. How you've ended up at this point. So I originally started off as competing semi-professionally in Call of Duty. Mm. So I was well known for being part of the first all-female roster in Europe for COD, um, attending my first event at the Emirates Stadium years and years ago. Um, but I spent my time over uh, from the course of being 15 to about 22 of competing um, at numerous events in a mixture of all-female rosters as well as mixed teams and made, well, I eventually grabbed myself the title of being the European's best female Call of Duty player, um, which Amazing. I still find somewhat embarrassing, uh, <laughs> but um, it's definitely an achievement and um, I, I definitely did a lot of press surrounding this at the time as well with, I did a short documentary on Channel 4, a Vice article with Julia Hardy um, and a campaign with Activision as well to promote one of the upcoming titles. Um, but mainly my background was in competing uh, for several years, but through doing all of these press opportunities, I found a passion in um, branding myself. So it kind of led into a career in marketing. Now I'm at the British Esports Association as the marketing manager. 
Mm, absolutely. I mean, that's. I mean, you've come in, like you say, Call of Duty, a very male-dominated game, very Indeed. male-dominated genre at the time, and very, very competitive as well. What year was that? Just interested in what version of Call of Duty. So the first title I competed on was Black Ops 1, was my first ever Call of Duty game, but I've actually been playing since COD 4. So COD 4 was where it all mm. began on the Xbox 360 for me. Mm. For me, it was Call of Duty World at War. I was forever being uh, sort of killed by remote control cars in Black Ops. It was very irritating, <laughs> but you did very well. Big stadium, massive event. Uh, and it's it's funny, isn't it? These events have been huge for some time. They've been big events in esports for you know, 20, 30 years that people, but it's never really hit, hit sort of mainstream. But let's talk about women in esports. You've, you come in very male dominated game in Call of Duty. Tell me about your work and your campaign with women in esports. So towards the end of last year, the British Esports Association launched a women in esports campaign. So this was basically to promote inclusivity and diversity throughout the esports industry. Uh, one way that we've been doing this so far is really speaking to those unsung heroes who work for big corporations such as we've we've done one with belong by game um myself and alice from british esports have also took part in a video interview and just some other people from some big com uh, companies within esports and speaking more about their roles and their successes which they've made through esports in some way so I guess our main aim through the content side of things is just to show that there are women who work behind the scenes in esports, despite it being a minority still, mm -hmm. um, but really to shed a light on, on that side of things. But this year, uh, content isn't enough really to try and inspire more talent to get involved. So our main aim really through this campaign is to implement long-standing change within the esports industry and I think a big way of doing that is having the conversations yeah. in the first place there's some big topics to discuss how exactly do we tackle this before we're able to move forward with things yeah I, you know I think a lot of it is also down to how how people perceive themselves even on Twitter and the way they speak I, I think that when you have people who have big brands behind them that there's a certain responsibility isn't there and I, it seems that over the years brands have struggled to control the output of their players there's obviously there's a lot of responsibility for for uh, you know big esport players and streamers uh, in terms of the way they put themselves across uh, ninja recently made a comment as well about anger about losing and i always think anger is a negative emotion to have around esports and we I, I think esports need to be fun and inclusive and enjoyable and competitive and there needs to be a, a respect for opponents uh, but obviously when you're in that obviously you're in that bubble it's always tough and you know how important that leaderboard is for that next step uh, and we all get a little bit of tunnel vision don't we when we're working in the world of esports but as a business growing Henning could there be an e-olympics it's something we've talked about we've heard as a buzzword do you think it can happen uh, so I would say it already happened many years ago. There was something called the World Cyber Games, which was initiated by Samsung, I think between like 2002 and 2012. I'm not sure when they ceased operations. Uh, this was a very popular event and they really had it in the theme of the Olympics. Of course, many of the games were still violent, which is one of the biggest issues. So while I think the, there's a lot of hesitation, we also have to remember that Sled Bob is still a, a competition at the Olympics, which, uh, you know, the amount of, uh, you know, how do you say active athletes in that sport can probably be, you know, outside of the people in being in the Olympics is probably not that many. So while we're eager to get esport in, we also have to understand that getting something out when we have several, I'll say sports, uh, whatever you wish to call it in the Olympics, which is staying there. Uh, I think we have to be a bit realistic with the reality. I think for sure there is a place for esports. And we also have to remember that, I mean, the esport titles come and go Fortnite three years ago. Fortnite in four years, who knows? So yeah. uh, we probably have to find a format within the community. Um, I think that we probably have to find our own way um, before we, we can actually be in the real one. Uh, and probably that is taking back something like the, the World Cyber Games and implement it together and, and run it side by side with the Olympics. Uh, because trying to fit this aging model of sports I don't know, like, I, I never liked the idea about adjusting to others. You should do what you're good at yourself. 
Esports is doing a lot of good things to himself. I I completely agree with your point on whether we need the Olympics to validate what esports is. Because if you think about it, on the respective games, we have World Cups across multiple titles anyway. So Call of Duty has the COD Champs every year, which brings different countries together to compete. Fortnite World Cup we saw last year, which was a huge success. And publishers are kind of taking the responsibility of doing their own worldwide tournaments anyway and do we need the olympics to validate esports yeah i think i mean i think the idea of the olympics uh, i think some people get annoyed when they think they hear the word olympics because they think of athletic sport physical sport and they get a bit confused and i think the idea of an e olympics it would be would be a, essentially a, like you say an event that brings the world together that brings different people from the world international competition you could end up otherwise with competitions as we have done with esports have ended up very much on domestic markets haven't they i mean we look at south korea and asia you may mentioned titles earlier like Counter-Strike or StarCraft which are so old it's unbelievable you know and you say we're growing as an esport but then we reference a game that's been out for years to an extent at the same time we have the instability of titles like Fortnite that may be around in five years it may not we just don't know what the future is we couldn't tell what's going to be here five years ago so I think in terms of it's more of a culture of, of bringing people together from different nations and bringing the world together we, we. If you were to have an Olympics, it would be bringing the world of esports together. I think, rather than anything, rather than just people around one, you know, one area of a game or one domestic market. But it is an open, open mind to it. I guess the next re- question that takes us on to then is, we talk about esports. When does a sport become a sport? Does a sport become a sport when you have a structure, a proper structure, a proper league, proper rules, transfer windows? that kind of stuff for players and so on. I'd probably say that it is when it starts to have a proper structure, but also there's the difference from playing casually to playing competitively. I think competitive is the key word as to when it starts to become more of a sport, but it is a constant debate whether esports is a sport. And, you know, personally, I I would say it's not. Mm. And it's still something that the industry are very tied up on or have been over the past couple of years where we're still having the same conversation about whether it's a sport it's it's one of those where it's down to you know personal opinion but definitely the competitive edge is what makes it more of a sport so monology henning uh, what do you think of esports? I mean, we're calling everything esports now. Uh, you, you will have seen it. Everything that involves competitive gaming is is referred to as esports. But is it a sport? When when does it go from playing a competitive game to becoming a sport? I mean, again, I'm looking at what is considered sports as the Olympics. You're shooting. You have all of these things. I mean, if I go down to the range and shoot, do I is that sport? Mm. Apparently. Then if I go and play against bots in CS or I do some, you know, ranked games in League of Legends, probably that's the sports as well. I mean, again, going back to how the general person thinks. So for me, I think I'm I'm agreeing that for me, actually, esports and sports is when you play competitively. When an esport becomes an esport, that's tough to define. But I would say when there is a proper infrastructure and a clear path to become the best, then there, there's definitely a sport uh, by the, the name of it. Um, how we, you know, is it a sport, is it not a sport? Again, searching for verification, I think the brands which is going into esport right now, I think everyone is convinced what it is. We don't need to have an identity crisis around it. <laughs> I think we've, we've all agreed on it. Now it's just about the, the rest of the world. What do they think? Um, because Right now, if you look at um, the traditional way of everything, it's it needs the digital part. It needs esports. So probably esports is, you know, it's there. It's just for people to accept it, and this will take time. It will take time. I mean, we so we we obviously we've debated here about an Olympics and you know the idea of it even being a sport and what a structure of a sport is. I think that's going to be an ongoing ongoing issue. We all, Henning said we all know what esports is, and I, in terms of big brands getting involved. And I'd say at the moment there still seems to be some grey areas there, but a lot of money is going in to esports now. Uh, I turn to yourself now, Morgan. Money going into esports. 
brands are saying we want to get involved we want to put money into it we want to build competitions from a marketing perspective is it because we want to get in touch with the younger audience we feel that this is the way to do it is it in streaming and such like do we think that's the value I think a common thing is trying to reach a specific demographic which esports definitely has it's, it's quite a wide demographic but typically um, this is where you manage to get in touch with the younger generation through advertising and marketing so I'd say that's one of the main reasons that uh, people are starting to get involved or wanting to get involved but the big issue that we have is that the knowledge isn't there on what esports is it's still something that we do at the British Esports Association is try to promote what esports is because you know I use this example all the time um I've been going to events since I was 15 and involved in esports events since I was 15 and I've explained constantly to my family and my dad in particular about what esports is and he asked me the other day do you still work for esports as in esports being a company I was like you just you just haven't got it so it it just seems like something that's not easy to pick up and it's also not easy to find the information I think I've had it before where someone's done the research on esports and said it was it started back in the 70s and all this Wikipedia gobble which you know doesn't summarize exactly what it is in a simple in a simple way so I think the more we promote and try and get people to understand what esports is the more knowledge that brands have when getting involved to maximize their potential within the industry. I'm seeing that esports is something I'm hearing from companies, and perhaps anyone will know more here, is uh, it's almost like players are being told, esports is big, you should be in esports now. Uh, I, I think that I hear it you know, sort of pushed all the time. So let's talk a bit about the players now for a moment. Cause yeah, if I may ship got... in first yeah, on sure. the other part. Sure. Um, so when it comes to why brand goes in, I agree with Morgan a bit because actually it is an audience which they cannot find. They use ad block to avoid all the ads, which they now learn they have to buy in digital landscape instead of print. And then when they do somehow reach the target audience, the problem is that they use the messaging, which is still for the people who re- read this uh, paper magazines. So for the brands, they're also making this uh, involvement. Okay, first of all, we need to sh- change our messaging to the younger audience. We need to take actually talk to the people who runs these community websites or are part of this community to, to make sure we do relevant communication, because otherwise their brand actually doesn't end up looking fairly good. I've seen numerous uh, examples of that throughout the years where a big brand comes in into esports, they haven't done and the proper job uh, or maybe the person at the esport organization briefing them on how they should communicate they roll out the same ad as they roll out on tv or have as pre-rolls on youtube and the result is not there and then they get scared mm-hmm. now so as an example since you know call of duty world league is one of the biggest franchise leagues launched this year if a brand joins this league the first thing they should do is ask the organizer and the marketing person how should we communicate toward this target audience how should our ads look Aren't we losing a lot of value from esports by not supporting the players and contracting them and getting that structure in place? Henning, what do you think of that in terms of that value? I think a bit wrong, considering the League of Legends franchise format. Uh, in those leagues, there is actually not that much movement. And that's based on an American structure, right? Where there is franchises, you have franchise players. They tend to be smaller movements. And within the League of Legends infrastructure, there is... Uh, or ecosystem, I should say, there is not that much movement. There is a lot of movement, but it's comparable with like an NBA type of movement because NBA is also a fairly small team. But if you look at um, an example, I, I know Call of Duty has been like this before. That's why you're feeling it, where I was trying to follow the Call of Duty scene before the Call of Duty World League, and then, I mean, they changed be- between every event. It was uh, <laughs> very interesting. So for Counter-Strike, I think this year, based on, on that there is only more or less two really big leagues and there's a third one which is kind of big and that there will be less movement just because of that they finally have a structure and for Dota everything is based around their main event which is the biggest prize pool in the world I think it's maybe it will be 40 million this year uh, so everything is kind of built up around that and after that everything gets scattered and, and everyone changes uh, but I think for Call of Duty now, with the new World League, I don't know, you guys are more into Call of Duty because the UK obviously is very console heavy. Uh, it should be less movement, right? 
Uh, it should be easier for the viewers to see, but for, for I, I can just talk on the PC part. The, for, for console, I mean, there's only the Call of Duty World League, more or less. I definitely agree with you on how it started to improve. Like, I wouldn't say it's it used to be roster mania and goes absolutely manic but ever since the introduction of the franchise leagues things are starting to see somewhat more structure than what we used to but definitely the the issue still lies in amateur organizations where people just switch teams every five minutes it feels like but in the in the higher leagues the pro leagues it's definitely more structured but maybe if you go from the pro league on rainbow six for example to uh, Challenger League, there might be more movement in Challenger League than the league above, for example. Yeah, I mean, it definitely seems to be some stability near the top. But I, I look, I mean, we keep mentioning League of Legends and StarCraft, Counter Strike, and all that. And I feel like I've been hearing those names for years. I don't feel like they're new esports. They are established, they've got big communities. I don't feel like we're taking esports forward when we talk about those titles. I feel like they're just big. You know, World of Warcraft, whatever, it's just big. It's just been there. I think that to get to the new markets. I mean, for example, Formula One have invested heavily in their esports over the last couple of years. But even they, you feel the players are being rotated. You know, Gran Turismo, and obviously I work in the racing genre, so I follow these. I mean, Gran Turismo, there's no protection at all. Uh, even last year's winner doesn't get invited back. Uh, and and I, just another thing on that, actually, uh, I just want to come across is players being paid. Now, uh, I wanted to raise a point. Gran Turismo recently had a had a tournament where players, the, the winners, none of the guys that made it to the final were paid, uh, and 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 the, the payment was seen as well. We've flown them to the final. That's the value for the players. It doesn't that devalue the players in, in terms of shouldn't we see players that are paid? Because let's face it, the the, the pressure required, the work required, it's a, it's a full time job. But there's no support for those players you, unless you have some kind of structure in place there's nothing for the players we should value our, our esport champions and we should value their uh, you know like i say value those personalities and i'm just a bit concerned that this is why you end up with with burnout so often is because those players are trying so hard that they feel that if they don't win a tournament they walk away with nothing and i think that's one of the key areas of the players and looking after those players and getting them up there at least when you have a contract and you're in the football premiership or Formula One, you've got a contract for a year. You have a bad match this week, you can have a good match next week. I just, I just see in esports that if you're earning nothing, you're coming in fourth place and you're earning nothing. I mean, let's face it, I mean, uh, with Fortnite last year, or earlier, yeah, last year, you had the World Cup. Everyone talked about the top, maybe the top three, top, top 10 if you were in the country that they're from. But outside of that, millions of players that, that practice all year round that are maybe just as good and it all went wrong for them in the final you don't hear about them so i guess uh, we've got two things here we've got valuing our players do we va does esports value its players should they be paid and how can we do better on burnout uh, morgan i'll start with yourself i think with esport teams in particular there's a big reason why they're not profitable and mm -hmm problems like you mentioned where you go to events where they probably invest on content and other things out of their own pockets mm. and there's no return for them it's yeah it's throwing money down down the drain essentially mm. um so that that could be where one of the issues lies specifically with that but also on the on the flip side of that if we were to go to the olympics that's rewarded in medals yeah so it would be the same where that wouldn't have a prize and should events be more to do with titles as opposed to prize money so it's a big again another big discussion. and that's the difference between amateur and professional esports isn't it i mean at the moment then the majority of esports is amateur uh, we have to look at it as amateur really and again that's why i suppose drawing the line of is it sport amateur is sport but it is amateur level a lot of people talk about professional esports. I hear this all the time, professional esports. Uh, and I say, well, what's professional esports? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, again, like sport itself, it's kind of a misused word, Henning. I mean, do you see that with players and the value of players? It's so hard to compare. I mean, if you look at real sports, first of all, there's so much more money. So like if you have the IOC, they give money, they give money. you have the local Olympic uh, committees, which gives which every year gives money to the, the athletes they deem most likely to be successful in the Olympics. 
And so they get money just because they're good. They don't need to perform. So they have a base already. So if, even if they, they're in a small sport, they still get the money from the Olympic Committee. So you, there, because there is no such infrastructure in esports for the small titles, it's, it's, it's impossible to compare. I mean, I hope Formula One do pay their players well, but if you pay Gran Turismo, uh, there is no franchise league where they have franchise sponsors and viewership and a good broadcast deal with a broadcast platform. So automatically there is no money. So then the scene has to go together and think, okay, how can we make money? Maybe they should start to create more content. Obviously, there is a great interest for for racing games. Maybe if they all start to create more content, there is an, a bigger interest to watch their tournaments. The tournaments will have bigger viewership. The viewership means they get more money from partners. Unfortunately, this is the reality. I mean, you can look at Rainbow Six. When it came out, it was not big. Uh, but actually, this is a bit of a Cinderella story in esports, I would say. This was not a title people expected to become big. And, and they were impressing... I mean, there was the major was just recently, even though the peak was lower than last year, our viewership increased again. So it's really an esport which is here to stay, and it's not one of these, like you mentioned, the traditional giants. And I think that shows that with some persist persistence and consistency within the title from the publisher, actually this is possible, but you cannot just sit and wait and hope money will come in esports because you have the, the you know, you have the EAs, the Activision Blizzards, and the Riots of the world who's gonna put every penny to be successful in esports. So, uh, you know, you, you need for speed, most likely it's gonna be the title EA wants to be successful, right? So it's unfortunate and of course we should value our players, but the reality is in real sports, it's the same. So the difference is if you're good at football, I, um, I highly doubt you can do a successful YouTube channel and have a successful live stream. But if you're good at Gran Turismo, you can start a YouTube channel and your Twitch, open your Twitch account today and start to make money. This is the charm, which I, you know, for me, this is the, the cool part of esports that, okay, my game is not big, but I can actually create my own content and be successful. This is the thing. Now that takes us to streaming. That's a whole different subject, whether you can make money from the game or esports. I, I just want to say, you know, there is, there is precedent for large price pots. We've had the Fortnite deal last year, the Fortnite price pot that hit the news. Everyone was talking about it. But we've had failures in the past as well. We've had money invested, it's disappeared. I mean, I mentioned one, just again, racing game was Visa supported the Formula E tournament in Las Vegas three years ago, uh, million million dollar prize pot. Uh, and the, in the Formula E, you get a fan boost, which helps you boost sort of once in the race. Uh, and unfortunately, the fan boost turned on, it didn't go off. Uh, the chap who won it won it because obviously his car was faster than everybody else's. He got to number one on the podium and then he stepped on number two and pushed the other player onto number one and it was a disaster. And what did we take from that? Well, one, it, it caused a lot of buzz because of the enormous prize pot, but also it showed that if if you want to buy your way into eSports overnight, it doesn't happen. Brands need to be open to the fact that it's... Uh, it's a long it's a long game you know we're looking at three four years to establish your your tournaments to establish your following uh, Morgan have you seen any sort of you know you've seen a lot of investment over the years have you seen anything like that in terms of where you know there was good intention but it hasn't always worked out personally I, I think your example was great I can't mm. think of anything quite on that scale or yeah. that amount of money where it really you know started to fall through i think the the bigger issue in the earlier days was that even at price pools where there was like ten thousand, is the issue of actually having it paid out in the first place yeah. and that's just not doing the necessary checks on the investors who are who are backing the event before it happened but obviously that's that that's not so much an issue anymore um but was so way back when yeah. um I wouldn't. I'd say it, there's more crises in terms of uh, sponsorships or people who wanting to do activations within the esports industry, and not so much with the with the prize pool or the, the event production um, side of things. But I think another large scale event that did happen, um, which was kind of a bit of a disaster, was on a production side, uh, which was the I think it was the Hearthstone tournament where someone made a political statement live and it was irreversible and they had to shut the stream off and it took right. it took forever to get a statement out of out of the publisher but that was something that couldn't be controlled because it it 
they didn't have the necessary things no. in things place. Things that can go wrong. So the rise of esports, I mean, the last few years, I mean, we've talked a bit about it to Henning earlier. Uh, it's it's hard to pinpoint some of the, the key successes. I mean, I, from my own perspective in the racing gaming genre, we've seen MotoGP, Formula One, WRC, all getting involved. What's big there is we've got big commercial sports that 10 years ago would have laughed you out the door. I mean, the motor industry was not interested. They saw no value in it and they didn't understand it at all. Now they've realized that gamers can actually be excellent simulation testers. Simulation saves them a lot of money and at the same time they can promote their brands. Gran Turismo had noticed over the years that, uh, that competitive players, people often buy the car that they play in the game. If you've ever played the game, you, you know, you've raced around, you've seen your replay and thought, I really like that car. Uh, so there's, there's hidden values there, but we look at the last five years and I see, I see those big automotive brands. What, what would you say have been some of the key brands from around sport and the, the sort of business sort of world of, of, of big brands that you've seen have stood out? I think it's, it's tough to say. There's, there's definitely a lot more brands that have got involved now in esports as you mm. mentioned we've now seen um dhl are involved in sponsoring events we've got mercedes mm. uh, we saw an activation recently through Fnatic and gucci uh, benefit cosmetics have got involved in a f- all-female event um which is hosted internationally i can't remember where it's from so more and more brands are starting to get involved in different ways and i think this is great in terms of promoting um, esports to a whole new range of people and getting the word out there um, but the, the brands is one way it started to really pick up and more people are hearing about it so I think the big bang moment in esports specifically within the past couple of years is all community based the amount of people who are involved in games so you look at more games releasing as free uh, those games that were a cost to to purchase such as Counter-Strike I think was originally £16 whereas that's now free and open to the public as they make their money through in-game purchases so this is essentially making it a lot easier for people to pick up a game and making games more popular because you don't have to have that initial Mm. £50, £60 or whatever it is for a a hard copy of a game anymore. Removing barriers to success there isn't it? Yeah absolutely and I think that so you've got two two angles and remove barriers. You've got the cost of buying the game, but also you need games companies and developers to add esports commentary modes to their games. I assume Henning. I mean, you, you've obviously when you're doing esports, you need spectator modes, you need commentary screens, stuff like that. What do we need in games to to take it forward? Is there anything games companies can add? I think the. I mean, there's still some struggles from what I understand with battle royale and how that, how you actually uh, spectate that in a <laughs> in a good overview way. I think in general they are pretty good. They understand viewership is the key. That's how you get brands into your um, into your title. I worked um, for a Swedish company. We had, for example, McDonald's. They started up with the buying through a media agency and ended up being a very important partner doing esports campaigns all over Sweden about their involvement in esports and this um, tournament. So I think in general, the, most of the publishers know today if they're going to be successful, the, the viewership is the key. Participation, that, that's going to solve itself. If you can see yourself in the stream, then you will play it most likely. Of course, it needs to be fun as well. So we've learned a lot on this uh, chat in terms of you know, investment, getting in front of uh, or new audiences using streaming, uh, videos, stuff like that. We've learned about the, uh, you know, the, the, the elements that games companies need to include. But uh, we've learned that also there's a lot of brand investment going in there and that brands are working hard to support esports and develop it. I think the, the last thing really is the support for teams and players. There's a lack of leagues, lack of structure. Uh, we've got the same top teams that we had 10 years ago. So as much as esports has moved forward, we're not seeing new blood coming into it. We're not seeing new teams getting a getting a, an opportunity or a foothold. Where do you see that changing, Morgan? Where do we see that stru- that actual structure coming in, or is it only going to be within the sports themselves? You know, like the Formula One or you know FIFA. 
I think it would be interesting to see how leagues end up shifting things moving forward. Because right now, the 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 perfect model for a league is the the franchise structure, uh, which Call of Duty have just recently developed. Overwatch have a franchise structure as well. But the one thing that was quite it was criticized quite heavily is that through having the franchise leagues that you're getting rid of the the grassroots element where majority of your players lie um where a lot of people are still wanting to compete but it's so competitive that you're not able to be within those franchise leagues that there's nothing there really for those people so i think what would be interesting to see moving forward is if we end up do uh, having something similar to football where we have your different categories of leagues so you have your your top league yeah. and then it filters down yeah. and there's there's several variations that people are able to qualify and progress which i think we already see in csgo with esea so you've got esa uh, esea main up to um mdl whereas that structure isn't really put across other games so there's a lot of people there that aren't really included so to make it more inclusive in the future would be ideal uh, Henning, I've just got a question for you actually on this. Um, players, they, they come to you with a sponsorship proposal and they say, I would like to be sponsored. They're, they're going to have to share with you branding, team results, exposure. Where do we see that structure coming together for, for, for teams and for brands? I mean, for teams, I, I do have to say that, again, I'll mention League of Legends, which has a complete sub franchise league which is called the european masters for example in europe where they have the full structure you can pay in spain and they have all over europe they have the national leagues and then it goes up to european league i think it's one or two times a year csgo is the best example where they didn't close everything 100 percent. it's like a, a mix which i think is very clear from both esl and uh, esea and also as well for the flashpoint league it's only the last pro series which is more or less closed but again, um, Call of Duty has this challenge. I mean, their first tournament, they had a, a nice tournament in the, the arena and the co- community competition in the garage uh, garage of the arena. So they still have some work to do there, I think. But if you look at all the other esports, I think they have a very clear path. Or it's called Path to the Pros is what they call it, more, more or less. So I think it's only Call of Duty which has this struggle and Overwatch. And that's also where you can see Overwatch League numbers going down uh, every week because there is no clear direction. It seems very unclear how, how a Swedish guy is supposed to, or a girl for that matter, qualify for the league. But if you look at League of Legends, they actually have female players. Once or twice per year, there's a female player joining the, the, the male teams playing. So um, this, uh, I think, is a struggle for some teams. And for me, when I look at it, we don't only look at winning. We look at relevance. Okay, so... What can I take as an example? I can take um, Finland. They have a very strong team called Ents in Counter-Strike. I look at, they are the entire Finnish market. Finland is a pretty strong esport uh, nation. They have a few champ- world champions in Dota. They also have uh, CSGO. They have a bit of League of Legends players as well. And the Rainbow Six players who was in part of the, the undefeated team that they were called back then. So they own the market. Everything they say, they control the Finnish market. So then that becomes relevant for me. They don't need to win every tournament. They have a share of voice and a relevance within the market, which is interesting for me. Uh, Because if I'm just going to go to winning, I mean, you mentioned before, we talk about the same teams. Well, I like football. Even if Liverpool, which is my favorite team, they were irrelevant for over a decade, besides winning Champions League once. Still, I'm pretty sure it's the newspapers, uh, the same teams they're writing about now. They wrote one decade ago with the exception of Leicester. Was it Leicester? This would be the only difference. It's it's the same in all sports. In the US, they talk about Dallas Cowboys and they have not won anything for three decades. If you talk in Europe, we talk about the same football teams in Spain, France, besides now PSG, uh, Germany, UK, it's the same. So me, I'm not concerned because this is how we work. We talk about the same things all the time. It's more about how can we make sure that the esport itself evolves. So, looking forward then, esports, where is it all going, Morgan? What can we see in the future? What are we looking forward to? That's a good question. Um, I think a generic answer is that people, are, uh, more non endemic brands, are going to get involved in esports, um, which is great for increasing knowledge and awareness of what esports is. Um, but also, uh, we mentioned how viewership is so crucial 
uh, within the esports industry and how that is starting to change um, in becoming more interactive. So you see League of Legends now has a service where you pay, I think it's within the LCS where you pay under £10 or um, and you can watch games in a completely new tailored experience which is you're able to watch the pov of your own like your favorite player um and you're also able to hear the voice comms of the teams so if you're not a big fan of listening to casters it provides an alternative that is more open to a wider audience so if you don't like one way this is another way for you to be able to experience this live stream so i think um a lot of production teams are going to start implementing things to make it more interactive and how streams are no longer static, I guess. Yeah, Henning, same question to yourself. Future of esports, where are we going? I agree. We will see more non endemic brands going in, which is good. We will get more money to the overall uh, esports ecosystem. Uh, I think we will see. hopefully see one more uh, genre. I mean, Battle Royale was, Royale was new. I'm hoping there will be another one around the corner. Maybe a comeback from a StarCraft type of game would be interesting, just to have the diversity. Um, I really, really hope, I mean, you're a fan of racing. I hope we can see one of these traditional esports going through. We have an initiative called G Challenge where we try to do our part of that. But I hope one of them, if it's FIFA or racing, really breaks through in a, in a broad way. I think that would be very good because that would make more bands who's a bit afraid of these traditional esports actually take the step in. So that's what I'm hoping for. And that I think everyone needs to hope that Call of Duty League and Overwatch League is successful considering how much money some people put into this. If this is not successful, then these investment uh, you know, firms all over US who put in the 30, 40 million in franchise fees are gonna be a bit nervous about esports in the future. So I'm praying a bit that Call of Duty World League and Overwatch League will continue to be successful and that this homestand activities that they have is going to be good as well. Well, I think that just about covers it. Morgan, Henning, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. New episodes will be available every week. And if you've enjoyed this one, please make sure to subscribe on your app of choice and leave a review. Don't forget to follow Logitech on Twitter at LogitechGUK, Facebook LogitechG.UK and Instagram at LogitechG. There you'll be able to learn more about the new Lightspeed wireless range that's now available. I'm Alan Boyston. See you next time.